Hello and welcome to the first live edition of the Nittany Dispatch. I am John Sauber of the Center Daily Times. She is Audrey Snyder of The Athletic and we did not get to watch football today. Uh, Audrey, how are you doing? Our Sunday has been torpedoed. Yes. I had this really weird thought today. I said, wow, my weekend started Friday staking out at Michigan's hotel. Concludes Sunday buried in my laptop uh, writing about Mike Yurst just firing. Because you broke the news, John. You made me work today. You are the one who made me DVR the Packers. This isn't my fault. This is, uh, this is you know, James and Penn State's fault for deciding to fire Mike Yersich. Uh, something that, it, it's funny, we talked about it yesterday. I asked you about it yesterday after you asked me about it after the Ohio State game. And you Literally, said like that 15 hours ago, you asked me. I was going to say. Were you yeah, trolling me? Like, did you ago. know? Did you know then? No, I did not. Okay. I did not know. Um, I, I was, uh, privy to some information this morning and then because we are, uh, ethical journalists, you, you don't want to rely on just a single source and then you got to work, mm-hmm. work the phones and everything. And then finally went, p- went and published it. I think one fifty five was the time, uh, that we published the story, tweeted it out and everything. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, you know, you, you first get the text and you're like, Oh, <laughs> like it was like, <laughs> honestly, if I'm, if I'm being real, my first reaction is really like today, like today. it's the Eagles bye week. I can finally watch all of red zone and just watch a bunch of NFL games, but alas work is work. And here we are. Yeah, John, maybe, uh, maybe James Franklin was listening to the Nittany dispatch on our post game Michigan episode. Maybe that's what did it. Uh, no, I mean, I, I am not surprised that they parted ways, right? Like I said as much. And again, that was at that point, that was just my gut Saturday night when I said, man, you lost your two biggest games. I don't think you can bring this guy back after that, after how poorly the offense has looked, especially in those two games. But that was just my gut. And to make the change now, to me, the timing is interesting, right? Because we know that Jaywan Sider and Ty Howell are going to be co-interim offensive coordinators, which yeah. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out. So my understanding as of now, and they're they're still like going through the planning process for this, right? Is that in all likelihood, Cider will call plays. Uh, I think we will okay. get more clarity on this tomorrow when we talk to James. We better. Moved his, I was going to say he moved his press conference to Monday. Maybe he was anticipating this all those weeks ago. Uh, but I, I think we'll get more clarity on it then. But my understanding right now is that Cider will get uh, the the crack at play calling, which uh, is not all that surprising to me. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I think we know that he has head coach aspirations. I, you know, he's been on those lists before, right? To be an offensive coordinator, to be a head coach. So this could kind of be a launching point for him potentially. And on some level, if it goes well, maybe it's a tryout. Uh, you know, you never know. I do know, you know, that this was uh, like this was something that was not necessarily a while in the making, but something that was kind of reaching its boiling point. Right. Like uh, there was some some issues with the offense, Uh, again, based on my understanding of all this, that there was maybe overly complex and that was creating some problems. Uh, And so there, you know, there were issues with that, uh, you know, and and it kind of it it all tipped over yesterday. Right. With the with the Michigan loss. So I will be curious to see where Penn State goes from here. But I mean, we kind of have to start here. Do you I mean, I I know you said it yesterday already, but do you think it was the right call to do this right now? I think so. I mean, you're playing Rutgers, which coincidentally enough, Kirk Shiraka is coming to town this week. Like what I, I tweeted about this and I was like, well, Kirk Shiraka. And then I had a bunch of people coming at me that are like, no, we shouldn't hire again, hire him again. And I was like, no, 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 I'm sorry. Like that was not my intention. I was just (laughs) pointing out a full circle moment. Like James Franklin is not going to rehire someone he fired after the 2020 season. Um, But, but yeah, I think, You've got two games. I mean, effectively, your season ended yesterday, right? And I think after a loss of that magnitude, two losses of that magnitude with Ohio State and Michigan, something had to change, right? Uh, Something had to change. Someone had to go. And you know it's not going to be James Franklin because of the $64 million buyout. Although we learned today Somebody had to go. If you're Texas A&M, I know. there is no number too high. Jimbo Fisher. Yeah. And so to me, someone or something had to go. And that's kind of, I think, why you make the change now, right? I, I think James Franklin was not oblivious to the booze yesterday, to the shouting, to the profanity as he walked off the field. Um, but but yeah, you've got to you've got to make a change. But then again, um, what does this get you long-term, right? Like, I think this gives you the next few weeks to kind of see what you have in Jaywan Sider, to see what you have in Ty Howell. Uh, 
But then James Franklin's got to go out. And whether this is an internal candidate, external, I don't know. But to me, John, and I'll have a column up tomorrow morning on The Athletic about this, but one of the things I was parsing through today is James Franklin needs to look long and hard in the mirror, I think, before he makes this next hire. Yeah, and, and I think that's the the important point of discussion here, right? And before we get too far into this, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, if you're watching live on YouTube or after the fact on YouTube, hit the thumbs up button down below. Hit the subscribe button. It always helps us out. Leave those five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts. Leave those reviews there too. Uh, but yeah, this is... You know, this isn't just about the offensive coordinator, right? This mm-hmm. there is there is more to this picture than that. There is a reason this has essentially worked for James once, and that was with Joe Moorhead, right? Like there right. is a reason that this is not just like it, it's he's had success hiring coaches at other positions. Like most other positions positions have had guys who have succeeded for whatever reason, and I think we probably can can deduce what it is. Mm-hmm. The offense is not succeeding as a whole consistently under James Franklin. And so I think you're right. I think that long look in the mirror is more important than anything right now. You know, how is he handling the offense? How, what is his involvement level? I'm not reporting anything here to be clear, but, uh, you know, what is his involvement? How is he impacting the offense? Are there what too many do? cooks in the kitchen, John? That's my question. Are there right? too many cooks in the kitchen? Because this is your sixth. They're going to be your sixth offensive coordinator. Uh, and you've been here for 10 seasons. That's a lot of turnover, right? I wrote about this a few weeks ago. I said, it's interesting to me that James Franklin's background is as an offensive coordinator and as a receivers coach. And those are the two positions that have had the most instability. Coincidence or not, right? Like to me, um, I think you really need to kind of to dig into that a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, as the question says below, what are, what are our thoughts on Franklin's influence on play calling? I think if there's any, like, and again, mm-hmm. I don't want to report anything that I'm not 100% certain of. I think if there is any, there should be none, right? This is, I know, I know James is an offensive guy. Like you mentioned, he coached wide receivers. But at the end of the day, part of the reason for the defensive success is that James just turns the keys over to those guys, right? <laughs> Bob Shoot, Brent Pride, Manny Diaz, like those guys are. You've only had three things. coordinators on that side of the ball. You're going to be six and, on the offense. And they've left, like Bob Shoup left for what at the time might have seemed like a, a bump up. Brent Pry left to be a head coach. If Manny Diaz le- leaves, we assume it's probably to be a head coach. Like these offensive coordinators aren't exactly leaving for these high profile jobs that the defensive coordinators are. And and I have to wonder, like, how much of that is the fact that they get to be the coach of the unit, right? Like, I, I think the best college football coaches now, for the most part, are the guys who give away the keys to the side of each side of the ball to the coordinators, right? And they go and they be the CEO and they manage the program and they run the program because frankly, they already have enough on their plate as head coaches. Yeah, you right? got a There's lot so to do. much going on. <laughs> yes. And so like meddling mm-hmm. is, is not helpful. I think within a program, not to say that James is, but if he is, it's something I think that it's an easy fix to potentially help the next coordinator. Yeah. And I think too, uh, he was asked a few weeks ago about, you know, the play sheet tucked into his pants, which is like always there in the front of his pants. Um, been there for a while. Yeah. Been there for a while. But I think that the question I think was meant to kind of allude to that, right? Is he overly involved with play calling? Uh, I did want to revisit John. You had asked the last, turns out this will be the last time we've ever heard from Mike Yersich, uh, yes. was on during that idle week zoom. And you asked him about, his offense here and how it looks different than Oklahoma state. And you and I have talked about this before and I pulled up the quote this afternoon. And the thing that James, or sorry, not James Franklin, the thing that Mike Yersich had (laughs) said, gosh, we're really spiraling now. Uh, The thing that he said was essentially like, yeah, this is a bunch of us getting together in a room. This is group think this is our head coach having an impact on all of this. So again, to me, in terms of play calling to the question, I'm not sure to what extent or not, but certainly in the overall scheme and what they're doing, he is absolutely involved. Um, and I think it's definitely more than fair to question if he's overly involved. And it's certainly something that I plan to ask about Monday because it needs to be asked again. Like we've broached the subject many times uh, and tomorrow we've got to revisit it. Yeah. And, and you know, the he's admitted his own involvement right on game days. He says he's on the headset making recommendations, mm-hmm. um, which I don't know if that like, generally speaking is the worst thing in the world like hey you are the head coach like maybe if you want to suggest like let's go for it here or the decision is to go for it here but let coaches let the coordinators pick the place right like let them decide what to do with that decision but if you're gonna do that right because he said like to me it was interesting when he said after iowa like i'm in the headset reminding mike to stay patient as a coordinator i always appreciate it when that happened so one you're micromanaging (laughs) two 
on top of that, if you're going to say all of that, then where would where were those reminders against Michigan when the big takeaway afterward was we need to call a game that gets our quarterback into rhythm, right? So I, you can't have it both ways, and I feel like that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, I, I think you I think you kind of nailed it, right? Like they they need uh, they need someone that one that is good at this, right? That can scheme up good offense mm-hmm. that we know can uh, put guys in positions to succeed that can maximize talent rather than kind of uh, you know mask spots where you don't have enough talent. Uh, I, I just don't know even the type of coach you look for at this point, because I would be curious to see the level of coaches that are willing maybe to take the job mm-hmm. because the of turnover. what we've seen. Yes. We've seen how often it happens. And we saw when Shiraka left after a year. And to be clear, when I say left, I mean, he was fired because <laughs> Mike Yersic became available. Your James really the, wanted him really, really wanted yeah. him that time. Yeah. And Yersich gets almost three years, but not the full three years because it was, you know, the idea was, okay, well, at least on my end, I thought they were quarterback away last year. And then this looks like a completely different offense than the one last year. I know some people will harp on Parker Washington and Mitch Tinsley's exit, but I have a hard time believing for as good of players as they were that those were the major issues. I think there are other issues, like I said, about the the complexity of the offense, that maybe that's why some of the younger guys aren't able to pick it up as quickly and they're not able to step in and fill these roles right away. Uh, But yeah, I think the the next obvious question is like, where, where do they go from here? What does it look like? Who is, who is the type of guy that, that you go and get? Yeah, I mean, I think it's this this whole thing is messy at this point. And I guess here's the other thing, John. <laughs> You've got your five star quarterback who came here in large part because of Mike Yersich, right? So I don't know if we'll hear from Drew Aller this week, but now that becomes a storyline. What is your quarterback's future? Um, and how is he feeling after all of this? Because I'm sure. Drew's going to think, you know, he's, I'm sure going to feel some of that blame because he even said it after the game yesterday. He said, I didn't complete enough throws. Like I didn't do a good enough job. Um, So to me, that's kind of the other, the other part of this too. Yeah. I I think one thing we've seen from Drew is that he always takes accountability, right? Like I Mm -hmm. think this is uh, something he's probably going to take pretty hard. It's a, it's a coach that, like you said, that he's mostly why Drew Aller is at Penn state, right? Like for all of the recruiting that everyone else did, it's that relationship that got him here. Now it's gone, right? Like now mm-hmm. he's obviously built relationships since then with, with other people that are on staff and, and other people around the program and, you know, the players and everything, but still the driving force that got him here is gone. So when we do get to talk to Drew, I will be curious what he has to say uh, because his, his future is uh, probably the most important thing for this program moving forward and maximizing him and maximizing his talent. Uh, because I still believe that he is the type of quarterback that people thought he was coming in. I thought, for the most part, he's been in a pretty impossible situation this year, right? Like, I don't think anyone has been setting him up to succeed. James Franklin included, by the way, this is, I I know uh, James said about the rhythm stuff. It's like, like you said, well, if you're going to put your thumb on the scale and say like, make reminders for Mike Yurcich, then give him a reminder to get the quarterback in rhythm, right? You have the play sheet, you know what the calls are. You can can make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah, You are the head coach at the end of the day, the buck stops there. And, you know, I'm sure we'll hear some of that with James tomorrow when we talk to him, that it'll be about, you know, that, that he ultimately is responsible for all of it and all that stuff. But still, like, you have to I, see Will we say that, John? I mean, because I think I that's know. what people have been waiting <laughs> you for would, him to you say. Would like, think, I think like, you the, would think. That's the socially aware thing to say is that. Yeah. And I think that's where so many people, I think, the anger kind of festers because of that, right? And so uh, you, you talk about putting Drew Aller in, in a good situation, right? We heard the last few years with Sean Clifford that, well, it's not really fair to Sean because we keep changing offensive coordinators. And while it's not really fair to our receivers because we keep changing position coaches. And then before that, it was the offensive line and they kept changing coaches. And these guys didn't know what blocking scheme they were running and they were getting mixed up because of it. Like all of that plays such a major role in why this entire offense has been disjointed and why this program on the biggest stages the offense has struggled. Like it's just to me, like that is the big theme of this. And man, what, (laughs) what a weekend for Penn state when you kind of put all of it together. Yeah. And listen, if you need to go somewhere to help drown those sorrows, there is nowhere better than Voodoo Brewing Company at Mm -hmm. 201 Elwood street and state college. It's a place that, that you and I, we've talked about plenty before that we both know and love. Uh, There's great people there. There's great food. There's a great environment. 
You can go for bingo or trivia if you'd like. Bingo on Thursdays, trivia on Tuesdays. Uh, it's fun. It's a great place to be. And frankly, they have great beer. And right now, I think everyone I need could one. use a great beer. Yes. Uh, After this weekend, I honestly, need a few. You know what I would really like right now? To eat breakfast. It's 5.45 p.m. I have had no it's, chance to eat yet today. It's not it's, good. Today's been bad. I, the thing was, I got up at like 7.30 this morning because I wanted to do my game rewatch because I was like, I'll do my you know typical game rewatch. We'll have that up on the site Monday morning, get my work done by one o'clock, watch the and yep. then nope. But I will say, John, uh, the last play of Mike Yersich's tenure yeah. was the swinging gate two point conversion call, which I rewatched multiple times today just to try and wrap my head around it. Uh, before I knew, you know, before the firing news came. And so that's how the tenure ends. Like that is the. It is. It screams of a guy who knows what's coming, right? Like who knows like this is my last. I, yeah. Like, you know, what? I, I do wonder. And I think, and you and I had talked about this before. I don't remember which, which day got, it could have even been Saturday night for all I remember at this point. I was going to say it genuinely might've been yesterday. It just feels <laughs> like yesterday was a week ago. Could have been a few hours ago. Um, but you made the point of Mike Yersich being in the booth this year, right? And then everybody kept saying, well, this is the best place we feel like to call a game. James Franklin said, as a former OC, you really, you need to be in the booth. And then we kept saying, well, the results aren't, they're worse. So like, what, what are you getting out of this? Um, and I think th the point you made then, and I think it's, it's a good one is maybe that was the last ditch effort, right? Maybe yeah. it was, Hey, if we put him upstairs, things will be better because you can see the whole field. Um, I don't know, but I will say, I know Ty Howell is typically in the booth with him. Uh, Jay Juan Sider is always on the sideline. So I, I am curious then if Sider's going to be calling the plays, what changes there? And then who is your quarterback's coach technically right now? Like I'm sure Danny O'Brien will still be involved. They've been really high on Danny O'Brien, but he's a GA. I so I don't know. Say, they're going to have an on-field assistant spot open now, mm -hmm. right? For these last two games in the bowl game. So theoretically you can make someone that's on staff, like a full-time assistant so they can recruit and everything. I, again, I'm not reporting this, but I would think like O'Brien makes a lot of sense just to do that temporarily. Um, and just so you have someone that's familiar with Drew, someone that's worked with Drew, it allows. Now, I don't know the the rules on this because they continue to change. Well, that's what I wonder. Right, 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 right. Uh, but they do have an open spot where they can have someone be an on-field coach now that Yersich <laughs> is not there. When the quarterback's because it was the immediate. room on Tuesday, who is there? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a, that's that's, that's yeah. going to be a good question to ask tomorrow. Yeah, I'll be curious to see what the answer is that we get. Uh, but no, I think honestly, like with with all that's that's going on, and this is perfect timing because question there that what are our opinions on the replacement that'll give Penn State a chance to have an exciting offense? Oh. The absolute first call that I'm making, given what's going on in Boulder right now, is to Sean Lewis. Uh, yes. If I'm James Franklin, I am going there. He was excellent at Kent State. Like he is, he was a mm -hmm. really good offensive mind. Hit the ceiling there. Took the offensive coordinator job at Colorado. They were having a ton of success, and then uh, Deion Sanders demoted him uh, and made uh, Pat Shermer his co-offensive coordinator, and seemingly took away play calling uh, duties. I would, I would give Sean Lewis the keys to the car. Uh, that is potential for a high flying offense. That that you know, that, that we haven't seen at Penn state since Joe Moorhead was there. Is that what it's going to take to unlock Dante Cephas? Yeah, honestly, that's a good connection. I hadn't thought about no, that yet. No, I, I actually, I, cause I tried to connect with Sean Lewis last year for a Cephas story. And that's, yeah, that's, that's why the name was kind of, kind of fresh in my head. Um, I, the thing is, I don't know James's like, obviously I have no idea his list of candidates. Kind he of has a list though. Like, I, I mean, assure I, I you think tomorrow he we'll hear, We'll hear that he yeah, has a oh, list yeah. that he keeps in his desk. We will hear that yes. at least once. He's got the little little black book or whatever it is, I think, yes. right? Um, I do wonder, and again, this is why I feel like the next few weeks now just got a lot more interesting because of Jaywan Sider and because Jaywan has been really loyal to him. I do wonder yes. how long and hard of a look they genuinely give Jaywan. One, because of his success as a recruiter and what he's been able to do with these running backs. Two, the players love the guy, and I think that kind of helps steer you in the right direction. Uh, three, on top of that, I, I think you look at this is someone who has had opportunities to go elsewhere, has said no, still has head coaching aspirations, but also told us earlier this season that if his if the rest of his career plays out and Jay wants it, if I stay in at Penn State, I will be happy. So you might even be able to get that stability piece there too. Depending, but as we saw last year, I mean, I think back to the defensive line job with Deion Barnes, right? James was interviewing everyone else and then was 
not really going to hire Dion Barnes. He even said as much this year, right? Like that was not the plan. And then last minute things changed. Uh, other people had changed their, their opinions on the job. And so then he hires Dion right before spring ball. So I, I do wonder uh, just kind of internally how long and hard of a look they, they give at J1. And obviously Ty Hell's part of that as well, but Hell's much younger. Um, yeah. I know they do think he's kind of like the young, bright up and coming guy uh, who's also done a really nice job as a recruiter. Um, but yeah, to, to me, that's you start there. But in terms of the rest of that list, gosh, I have no idea. I mean, it, it could be yeah. it could be anyone there. The, the only thing that I think is difficult if they promote from within, it's like especially for maybe coaches that haven't been offensive coordinators before. It's like, well, how much of the offense then is just what they've been running in the past? Right. And how much is mm -hmm. OK now? James just really has his hands all over the offense. Right. Like I think. Yeah. probably I'm assuming fans would like to see a coach come in from the outside that has their offense that they run mm -hmm. and just to have it be that offense that it doesn't have to be a melding of the mind situation that, that that coach gets to run their offense. Maybe terminology is similar to what it is now. So it's easier for the players to change it to transition. But outside of that, like I wonder if the complexity of the offense John. was an issue, like what are they going to do with this? 700 signals. We just heard it last week. They've got over 700 signals on that offense. <laughs> so I, no, think about, I again, in terms about of that. Yeah. Learning, yeah, learning, adapting changes for, for your quarterback. Again, like you're not, you're not putting these guys in a position to succeed. And that is a failure on the coaching staff with all these transitions. Right. I mean, think about it. Bo Prabula committed to Kirk Sharaka. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like let <laughs> that one set it, right? Yeah. Right. And then Aller was the first guy that Yursich offered, and that was his guy. And then Jackson Smolik was his guy. And then you look at Ethan Grunkemeyer was his guy, who's set to early enroll in January. So now you've got quarterbacks fitting probably one type of offense with one type of coordinator that they were bought into. And you have to wonder just what that whole picture looks like, especially because like Smolik's recruitment was really interesting and in that it seemed like Yursich almost had a type that it was like, he wants these yeah. guys to get them before they get really big on the radar. Uh, and then he'll kind of, kind of almost fall in love with them, so to speak. Right. That's when he recruits him. Um, but yeah, how do you kind of go with that? Like to me, that's that quarterback room is going to be fascinating. Yeah. And, and the bright side is like uh, now uh, to be clear, Drew Allers, uh, barring a change of of his mind of where he wants to be, he's going to be the starting quarterback next year. I would be stunned if that was not the case. Like absolutely floored if that's not the case. Uh, but I, I think the the, yeah. the seems to be bought in here. <laughs> yeah, right? like I, I, it seems to be right. That well, that's the thing. Like these changes and with the portal, like we don't know. Like we really don't. Like we talked to Drew mm -hmm. last week. And so much has changed in those five, six days. Again, whatever it feels like, three months maybe. Uh, but whatever has changed that those last five, six days is monumental. Like his mind could have changed completely since then. We just have no idea right now. Uh, and hopefully we get to talk to Drew soon because like you said, that's going to be really important. But I do think the idea that the coach gets to run what they run regardless. Like you can't, to me, you can't go into this thinking, okay, I need someone to fit the personnel in 2024 because then that's how you make the wrong hire, right? That's how you make it for fit yeah. rather than making hiring the best person for the job. Uh, you know, I mentioned Sean Lewis, Cliff Kingsbury is on staff at USC, but not uh, an on field coach right now. I don't oh. think that to me is the funniest outcome. I am definitely rooting for it. No, from way. my standpoint, absolutely <laughs> not. Listen, I'm again not reporting, but it would be very funny. <laughs> uh, and I am all for the yeah, that is not those types of things. But no, I do think they they, yeah. they need to they need to make a hire that is going to come in, put their stamp on the offense, and let it be their offense. That matters more than absolutely anything right now. It cannot be James Franklin's offense. It has to be whoever they hire's offense. And until frankly, until it's proven otherwise, I don't know that there's a reason to believe that it will be, right? And when can they prove otherwise? Mm -hmm. August thirty first when they play West Virginia. Gosh, you're already starting the clock, John. I don't, you know, listen, I'm that's when they're going to coach their first game. Yeah. I'm thinking about all of this and it's like, you know, we've written so many of these stories over the years and obviously I've been here much longer than, than you have on the beat. And it's like, Oh, a new coordinator comes. Well, okay. Who are they? And then how's the transition going? So all winter and spring, we're going to be writing about this damn transition, yeah. which is like, we, I, we do this all the time. And how's this is my first time offense? having to do it. Oh, lucky you. I mean, this is, I came in during the spring of, it was, it was your first spring, right? 2021. Ah, yeah. yeah. So you, it was you've seen first nothing spring. then, John. 
Yeah, no, it is. Listen, I have uh, I had the the Manny Diaz transition uh, too, so I, I at least know what it's like on well, that side of the ball. But there's more success there, so it's a little easier to write about the transition. There are only so many transition stories we can write, and I think too once you get into um, you get into all of that, I, there's the possibility that Penn State heads into two new coordinators, right? Like that's, that's a distinct possibility depending on what jobs open. And and then we go back to the, not the, not the create widespread panic, but then we go back to the, Oh, 2024 was supposed to be the year. Well, maybe you have two coordinator, new coordinators now. And we've already seen a look at that schedule. And that is a hard schedule. That five green five game stretch is brutal. Um, So that's kind of why I kept telling people, cautioning them, Hey, 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 don't look ahead to 2024 so far because anything can happen. And I think today, Sunday, was kind of that, oh, yeah, something has happened. Uh, and James Franklin was making a statement uh, by dismissing Mike yeah. Yersich. Yeah, and this is this is going to be uh, – it's difficult to win with a completely new offense. I understand that right away. Uh, but it, it's not just about 2024 mm-hmm. as much as it, it may suck to hear that, right, that like this year that everyone's been building to, all of a sudden – you know, now it's like, well, they're transitioning a new coordinator in, at least on offense, potentially on defense, too. Maybe it's not going to be as great as you think. It's about the future health of the program, right? It's not just about now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know how it's going to go. Uh, we have a question here with Manny re- receiving the last of his Miami contract money in 2023. Do you see him being able to be retained? Uh, I You can probably speak to this as well, Audrey. I am not under the impression that money is going to be an issue with either no, of these I, tires moving. I, I don't think... I don't think money money is an issue, and I do think that that's kind of a narrative that a lot of fans have brought up over the years. Um, Penn State it may have been the case in the willing, past. It is yes, yes. Yeah, it, it is not now. Not since James Franklin's first few years, uh, they've Penn State's made a much more uh, cognizant effort to to be competitive, to be highly competitive with their salaries. Um, so I don't think the money is an issue. I think it's just a matter of is there a head coaching job that fits Manny Diaz's requirements, the parameters that he's looking for. And if that job comes open, then I really don't think there's anything Penn State can do because either you want to be a head coach or you want to stay here and be a DC. Uh, And so to me, like, that's just the thing. If he wants to be a head coach and there's a good opportunity or an opportunity that he thinks is a good fit, um, Penn State is not going to get in the way of that. I I just don't see that being a case. Uh, But if he wants to be here, he's certainly put together one heck of a portfolio that he should be here if he wants to be here. Um, and they should pay him whatever they have to pay him to keep him. Yeah. You back up that Brinks truck. Uh, maybe you pay the next OC a little bit less, slightly less if that's what it comes down to. I don't know about that. I'm probably um, still trying uh, John, to I'm talking, I'm talking <laughs> like money to us. That is like that's big, fair. but to them is insignificant. Right. Um, but I, you got to do it every, whatever you can to keep Manny Diaz if, and only if he wants, wants to be here. Because again, let's be honest. Like you look at people getting the raw end of the deal this year, that defense, I mean, those players, this defensive staff, um, this season is not on them. And I do no. wonder the next two weeks, uh, is there any splintering of, Hey, we've more than done our job on defense and this offense is, has been poor at best. Uh, I so think, I do wonder how you keep that together. I think this decision kind of quells those concerns. I think it for helps me that. Yeah. Because uh, even, even if it's not necessarily true, like, like that it's your such's fault, everyone on the offense can be like, well, it was on that guy, right? Like it can, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They can easily hand wave it away now that, oh, this won't happen anymore. Sure. You know, they might struggle the last two weeks, but it's okay because there's going to be a whole new system, a whole new scheme, what have you. Uh, Which goes back to what I said though, about kind of not being able to promote from within. And and they still can, by the way, I think that is probably an option at this point. But again, we are very early in this. We are uh, from a few hours into it. (laughs) Yeah. Like nine hours from when it happened, eight hours. I don't know. Math is hard. Uh, But I, I do think like, there is going to be uh, a difficulty in selling to the rest of the program that, Hey, we're going to run the same system, but with a different person calling plays. Uh, and otherwise you have to have a coach who has their system, right? Like you know, Jay one sider mm-hmm. very well might, he's a very prepared man. Like he's, you know what I mean? I think he's going to be a head coach one day and I think he's going to be very good at it, but I don't know if he has a system because we haven't seen him run one right at this level. So I do think the need for that is should outweigh anything else. And it should outweigh like the idea that they want continuity because frankly, I think continuity is overrated in college football. When it comes to a lot of things uh, you'd like it, right? Like it's ideal, but you can usually come in and be pretty prolific pretty quickly. Like 
for instance, Sean Lewis did right away at Colorado until he became the scapegoat there for something that was, I think, pretty clearly not his fault. <laughs> oh, John, you're going to get everyone's hopes up for Sean Lewis. And then you that's know. right. <laughs> Championship- I, I already said that I'm not reporting anything. Yeah. Championship defense wasted. It's like having chicken nuggets with no French fries. You're not wrong, right? I mean, this honestly, is- that is very apt because I cannot think of a time that I've ever had chicken nuggets and no French fries. It is mandatory to have both of those things. Well, John, you are pretty much an adult child, so that kind of yeah, we that know that. Meshes. Yeah. We all know that. An adult child who has not had his breakfast today and who has not slept much. <laughs> At six o'clock, John has not had breakfast. Six That's p.m. Right. Well, listen, I, you know, my sleep schedule, it's usually a nightmare today. Or at I woke best. Up, mm-hmm. Yeah. I woke up at eight 30 for no reason, uh, decided to watch Patriots Colts, which was not a good reason to be awake, uh, get the first text. And it's like, you're just adrenaline at that point, like adrenaline and anxiety and trying to do your job well. Mm-hmm. Right. And getting a hold of people and all that. So no, I've had, I've not had much time to think today, let alone eat. Uh, it's been go, go, go since the start. And Outside of that, you know, there there hasn't been been much else going on. And by the way, like that was you should have seen me trying to write the story itself. Yes, we uh, Jack Straw, PSU beat writers must be tired today. Don't forget Monday presser, guys. I am hoping spent. to go to bed sometime <laughs> Monday night. Like I'm thinking that's the next time. No, I you could definitely to go to bed here. tonight. You could definitely yeah. go to bed tonight. No, I'll sleep in. Um, I'll be sleeping in until probably like ten thirty. Yeah, I mean they they've come for our NFL Sunday because of the news. Yeah. They've taken our day off on Monday because of the Monday presser, John. This is this is what our life has come down to: emergency podcasts at six o'clock on a Sunday night. Um, because yeah, Penn and it's, it was a good day. Of, out. It was a good day of NFL games too. I was pretty frustrated. <laughs> like I, like you I know what? I had this. I had the Packers on mute, but mm. I DVR'd them. Like obviously, I know what happened, but I will go back and watch it because I'm just you know that that's my thing. That they've you ruined are, are today. Um, well, it's but, like it's I, I have to rewatch the game again. I rewatched it for good, bad, ugly. And I, I usually watch the game three times. But do you, because, John? Again, do I am who I am. Do but, you need right, to like now? It's like Michigan now? Well, now I just need to rewatch defensive snaps because the offense mm-hmm. is like, well, this is out the window now. Yeah, there was a column that I was working on Sunday morning that I trashed because obviously the situation changed. <laughs> so what I was writing was not really pertinent That's my anymore. Bad. Uh, then there was also like another story because I, I was rewatching the game and then I was like, why am I doing this? No one's going to care because well, so let me work on this other story. So then I work on that other story. Well, then no one cares now because of the year such news. So I've pivoted. So there will be another column up from me on the athletic tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe I think, no, it's filed. It's filed. Uh, that okay. one about, about Mike Yersich and why I think this is such a pivotal moment for James Franklin. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was parsing through old interview transcripts today because, again, we don't one of those coordinators days. often. Yeah, so you're, you're digging yeah. through your, your audio devices and trying to, to find interviews. And um, yeah, I mean, you, from a, a human level, right? Like you obviously you feel for Mike Yersich, right? This is yeah, a human being in a yes, very public a family. spot, yeah. has a family, has young kids, um, and it just flat out did not work out and you don't wish that on anyone. Right. And that's just a and really you wonder, tough day. Back to what we've said earlier, you wonder how much of it really is his fault. Like, mm-hmm. yes, he's responsible for the offense at the end of the day, but it can be difficult to do your job when your boss is meddling, Yeah, you know, and we don't know if that's true. We don't know how mm-hmm. much it was true. If it is true, but if that's the case, then he was never really in a position to succeed. And I, you know, I talked a lot of the, about that with Drew Aller, right? Like if that your sitch wasn't putting him in position to succeed, well, what happens if your sitch wasn't put in position to succeed by James Franklin, right? Like it, it, it goes both ways. And so you, you, you feel for him on that level uh, because he really did put together some prolific offenses uh, at Oklahoma state, like really fun to watch stuff. I, when he got hired, I was like, Oh man, this thing's going to be high flying. It's going to be really interesting. But you know, looking back, you, like I said, you hear like the overly complex stuff and everything. And then it's like, you know, maybe, Maybe it worked at Oklahoma State, but it just was never going to work anywhere else. You know, maybe it was a specific group or specific groups he had because he was there for a while. Maybe there were to work. too many wide receiver passes here, um, <laughs> too many Bo Prabula packages that just we never saw in the biggest moments of games this season. Yeah, That's John, what I want to know. Who was responsible for the wide receiver pass? <laughs> I demand good. names. That's what we're going to go into James the Monday tomorrow, presser yeah. with. James, who <laughs> I'm really kidding. Don't hold me to that. that. Um, John, what is your ultimate like moment or memory of the three, almost full three season Mike Yersich era? What's the one moment where you say either it was really good or really bad? Like what, what sticks out to you? 
honestly, and I know it's probably recency bias, Mm -hmm. but it it kind of led to the demise, I think, here. Uh, I don't remember who I was standing with on the sideline of the Ohio State game, but when Keandre Lambert-Smith attempted the on the two-point try, like when they went back to the wide receiver yeah. pass, I turned to someone, and I used an expletive at the time because, again, I am who I am. Uh, but I said, are you kidding me? Like, I could not believe it. Like, I was genuinely in shock uh, that it happened, and that felt like the beginning of the downfall, right? Like, that that be, that be felt like this was the beginning of the end for Mike Kiersich. But I'm curious. I'm assuming you yeah. have something, given you asked me. What's yours? <sighs> I mean, I go back to just kind of the quarterbacks that he's recruited. And I remember talking to Drew Aller when Drew was in high school and like, okay, like Mike just offered you, like, what do you know about this guy at this point? And uh, there was an instant connection there. And, you know, the, the I think the year such that we saw like in interviews was not the most profound quote was not. The most, I don't know like, that he liked us much. Yeah, I definitely don't think he did. Um, I don't think, I think he enjoyed talking to us, at least. No, and I think that was kind of part of the part of the issue when you think of like, I mean, I remember when he got here thinking, wow, how long is this guy going to be here? Because we'll probably move on, maybe be a head coach somewhere. Um, but no, I go back to the quarterbacks, and it's like Drew Aller's recruitment does not happen without Mike Yersich. Like, I think this is a kid who ends up at Ohio State if it wasn't for Yursich. So how does that play out, right? Jackson Smolik, we've heard good things behind the scenes this year. Um, But this is someone, again, who Mike Yursich was in on before Smolik, his really bizarre recruitment really kind of blew up. Otherwise, this was a kid who was committed to Tulane. Um, So so I kind of think back to that. And then you've got Ethan Grunkemeyer. So like you've got this Ohio pipeline, right? And you think back to Aller's trainer, who's also Grunkemeyer's trainer, Brad Mandler. Um, Brad has a relationship with Mike because Mike's an Ohio guy like Brad. So like you're losing the Ohio connection for sure, which I'm very curious with, with the next OC again, depending who they bring in, what the recruiting ties are and all those types of things. But the biggest thing to me is like, you've got to get this offense corrected. Like the rest of the recruiting stuff will work itself out. You've got a staff with good enough recruiters elsewhere. Um, but you've got to figure out this offense because it's been a revolving door. And I know it's been maddening for fans uh, who I'm sure there are a lot of people that want to kind of have some, some nice relief today that this is this tenure is over, but yeah, it's, it's been a ride. I think we'll think of the receiver passes, the two point tries. Um, We'll be reminded this weekend with Kirk Shiraka in the building of all the fades So yeah, it's it's been the uh, it's been an experience, John. It's run the gamut, uh, yeah. but I am curious. You know, what do you think the timeline of this looks like? And there, there, these are the last two main things I think we haven't talked about yet. What does the timeline look like? And what is the next step for Mike Yersich? Because this is Oof. like he yeah. he's bounced around a little bit before he got to Penn State, and mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't exactly sunshine and rainbows here. Yeah, uh, two good questions, good points. Um, I think the timeline, you've got to look at that early signing period, what, December 20th, I believe it is, what, we're November 12th today. Um, Because whatever James Franklin is telling recruits right now, like, that's going to go a ways. And I'm going to have to put in calls to a lot of those guys and shoot out text messages and that stuff is is really pertinent because you've got to have someone in place. Like, Grunkemeyer plans to 100% early enroll here. Well, he's got to know who's who's in the room before he gets about here, two months right? away. Before he signs the yeah. paperwork. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think ideally that's what you, you do, but we've seen in the past that they have not always done that where they've come back in the winter and then kind of waited like a week or so, right? Like Taylor Stubblefield last year, the firing happened, I believe after the players were already back on campus, I think. It was, it was, yeah. That was like mid. It was really weird. Yeah. I remember because I was visiting some friends out of state because I was like, this will be an easy weekend. And I was Wrong. watching uh I was watching Giants Vikings and I got a text before uh Taylor broke the news himself on mm-hmm. Twitter and I was like, Are you kidding me? I was, I was like, I just wanted to enjoy it myself. So this is just a Sunday thing. Every Sunday. Yeah, that that, that was the enjoy. Sunday night. Yeah, they've come for our yeah. Sundays many times here, John. Because right. and that was then Dante Cephas committed right after that. That was a nice yes. um, I at least had that one pre written. In terms of yeah, we had we had that one locked up. In terms of um your such's future, I you bring up a good point because he has bounced around a lot, right? Like this was the guy who early on, it was kind of like the, the wild hire out of the PSEC. And you're kind of looking yep. at him thinking like, how in the world is this going to work? And then it did work. And then 
you know, you go on as his career progresses. And obviously Oklahoma State's a massive part of that. But then you have the time um, at Ohio State. You have the time at Texas. And then if you're someone looking to hire him after the tenure here, like it is the explosive play numbers are brutal. I mean, this is one yeah. of the least explosive offenses in the country. When you look at the metrics uh, in terms of plays of 20 plus yards, I was looking at this earlier today uh, per true media, which is the source we use at the athletic Penn state is dead last in the country. So for all of the crap that James Franklin wanted to give people about chucking it deep, about not airing it out, ultimately it came back to bite you and it came back to bite yep. you in the two biggest games against good defenses on big stages. And really like, it's a bad look all around. And I just, yeah, I have no idea what the future holds for your sitch. Maybe is this something where we see him take a step back, right? Is there I, like, I have to think I don't, like it's tough. I, I generally think it'll be a lower power mm-hmm. five lower or level. a high level group of five type program. Right. Because it's, we've seen, he hasn't been a head coach, right? Like we, like that's, he, and he quite frankly, like John, into, I, I don't think he has the, personality the persona to do that at least not publicly based off of what we've seen i do not think he's built for that i also would really kind of question i'd be curious how he interviews um because i'd i'd be i'd love to be a fly on the wall i'll put it that way i think we might know how right (laughs) i don't know that i don't know that we have to think about it too much uh but no i i think i think your sitch is probably looking at like a group of five offensive coordinator where he runs the offense and then if it looks different if it looks totally different and we know there that new head coach is got their hands off, then I don't know, maybe that'll give us some information, right? I think, I think your next stop might be just as telling as, uh, you know, whoever gets hired at Penn state, because we'll learn a lot about, uh, how things were handled here. As far as the the timeline, I think it's gotta be early December, right? I, I, I'm again, not reporting. You're saying early December. You're, okay. Yeah. Before to in give yourself time. Visits. Yeah. To give yourself time because it's not just about the signing day. It's about building the relationships before signing day, right? Like making sure those guys are comfortable with this person. Mm-hmm. Um, and listen, you make the decision on November 12th. Like this is, uh, this is not, uh, late, right? Like you, you are giving yourself a head start on the rest of the competition with regards to finding candidates. And we'll talk to James about this tomorrow. I, I'm curious what his timeline is. Right. And, what the advantages are other than seeing what cider and uh and how can do there's a major advantage to knowing okay we have an opening now we can go interview other guys right like they cannot they cannot uh make that a waste they have to take advantage of that they have to figure out at least have a finite list they should have their finalists by the end of the regular season and they should be able to make a hire in early december otherwise uh, maybe they're waiting for a coach to finish their season whatever but like otherwise it's a failure right to not have that kind of higher in place or at least an idea of that higher in place by then because you're giving yourself the head start for a reason otherwise just let them coach out the rest of the year yeah no i think i think you're right like you make this decision now i think for for many reasons uh who would have thought john looking back to the penn state iowa game both ocs technically were on the hot seat (laughs) technically would be gone by the end of the season and the one from the winning team that scored 31 points would be out of a job officially, technically, before yeah. Brian Ference. Weird. Yeah, that's a tough look. That is a tough look. Brian Ferentz is available if James is looking for... Oh, to, gosh. To oh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, Everybody man. That, that. That's oh, fine. gosh. That spiral would be... Yeah, you've you've just spiraled yeah. a lot of people, John. Sorry You're to everyone that I just Sunday upset. night. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, yeah. no, I think, I think we pretty much covered it all, unless you've got something mm-hmm. else. Uh, no, no. Is, I hope. Uh, thanks for for joining us uh, tonight on yes. this emergency episode of the Nittany Dispatch. Um, this, especially those of you watching, we're going to be back. Yes, those yeah. of us watching live. Uh, this is something we wanted to test out. Um, I'm sure we'll be going live at some other point this year because God forbid it's always smooth sailing and nothing ever <laughs> news ever never breaks around here. Uh, but don't forget to rate, review, subscribe the Nittany Dispatch wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate it. Uh, we will be back midweek for sure. We'll fill yeah. you in on all After that we, we hear James. from James Franklin. I'm sure we'll hear from some players between now and then too. That'll be interesting, especially on the offensive side. Um, yeah, and I'm sure both of us will be will be writing. Uh, mm-hmm. You mentioned the column that you'll have tomorrow uh, over at the Athletic. Don't forget to check that out, Audrey. I'm sure we'll be tweeting it out at Odd Snyder Four. Uh, I will have some names and a list <laughs> that that people will get to enjoy of potential candidates that that I think. And one of them is not Brian Ferentz, to be clear. Uh, 
no one of the maybe i should just for fun that would be a good time oh, God, no. uh but i i will be putting in sean lewis in that list spoiler alert the little head start for everyone that is listening to the show sean lewis will be there and i'll elaborate on that and why i think that's a good fit but but no i think uh you and i are going to have a lot on this over the next few days you can find me on twitter as well at, at john sauber uh that's going to do it for this episode of the nittany dispatch the first emergency episode the first live episode of the nittany dispatch thanks for tuning in have a great day